All right, welcome everybody. This is Paul Doherty here. I'll be your, uh, your host today. And uh, today's talk is a prep tech talk and it's titled The Innovative PIO, Tools and Best Practices for Technology Enabling Public Information. And I'll just do a quick uh, audio check. Can the audience hear me okay? You should be able to just type in through the chat. All right, that's a yes. All right, so why are we here? Across the public safety community, we've seen the advancement of geospatial tools and maps to provide situation awareness in uh, all environments from the you know, emergency operations center like you see here at, in Sacramento at Cal OES, all the way out to the incident command post. And we've seen a growing adoption of this. And I would say many agencies are just really taken off in their use of geospatial in a, in a room like this. But what we aren't, what's not so clear is, you know, is this capability expanding into this EOC, the living room for the public? For this capability of internal situational awareness to actually uh, make a difference, you know, it really has to impact those trying to make decisions at home. So, you know, I like to say inter, inter, internal situation awareness means nothing to the public if they can't see it or use similar information to make decisions in their own living room or office. So that is today's topic. Our objectives today is that everybody should leave with a better understanding of some of the common challenges and solutions associated with public information. You'll hear two stories from innovative public information officers and emergency managers that, can, that they can use or you can use to raise thoughtful discussion in your own agency. And best practices and tools for public information exchange that you can get started with today. And I did want to mention this is supported by the DHS Science and Technology Project for Technology Innovation. Our rough timeline is uh, we'll do a little bit of housekeeping and explain what the webinar is about. We'll do a quick hands-on exercise. So get your mobile devices ready if you have one. Um, and then we'll hear from our speakers. We'll wrap up with some more best practices and tools you can use. And then we'll do a question and answer session via the Q&A feature in Zoom. So really important, if you have a question for the panelists, we want you to use the Q&A tool in Zoom, and then we will triage those questions at the end, and uh, Jared Doak from my team will help to do that. The slide deck, the materials, and the recording for today's session will be posted to the NAPSEC website, and an email will go out to all registered participants. Uh, as far as Zoom goes, I just wanted to list some of the security features we've implemented based on feedback, especially from our federal stakeholders uh, since the beginning of COVID-19, and uh, we put those there for your safety. And again, in order to engage and participate, please use the Q&A functionality within Zoom for questions. So a little bit about NAPSIG Foundation, uh, just in case this is your first prep tech talk. We are a nonprofit organization that was established in 2005, and we have a vision. Our vision is a nation of emergency responders and leaders equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcome for survivors. So uh, our mission spans across the public safety mission, and uh, in particular, we take interest in the use of technology, including uh, geospatial. If you haven't already, please visit our website at www.napsigfoundation.org. Uh, how we work towards this vision is sort of a four-step process. Uh, we help define and promulgate best practices through guidelines and standards. You can find those on our website. We help to foster regional collaboration uh, through exercise simulations and occasionally through uh, projects. We help build capacity in the use of innovative technology through education and training. That's part of why uh, you're all here today. And we help to transfer knowledge and skills via tech assistance. Uh, often we get pulled into doing this during disasters, but we actually prefer to build on these other foundations so that you don't need our help. And that's the real goal. Uh, our audience is, spans a 20,000 member network. We are working on uh, enhancing our NAPSIG community platform to better engage the network. But uh, overall, we're uh, made up of all disciplines within public safety, all levels of government. And just for today's webinar, uh, we mapped out 230 of our participants and the primary sector was emergency management and the uh, uh, largest jurisdiction was local government. But you can see here a number of other affiliations and jurisdictions. And we could really use your help spreading the word to the Dakotas, Nebraska, Wyoming, and Montana, where it seems like we have a gap, maybe New Mexico. 
Uh, I did want to mention, I know we're still uh, responding and recovering from COVID-19. NAPSIG has stood up a COVID-19 resource, and we'll talk a little bit more about that next month. Uh, today won't be fully focused on that. You get a little bit of a break, but wanted to mention that as a resource before we get underway here. So a couple of key messages and uh, recap from December. We had a webinar in December on a similar topic. Uh, we heard from Sonoma County and how they've used geospatial tools for public information during fires and floods. Um, we also covered a bit more of the tech on how to use maps for public information. Today, we'll hear a little bit more about the team and the approach. One of the important things we raised were, you know, what are some of the core information needs for the public? And I sort of planted this in a poll, but the three core uh, themes that emerge are uh, shelters, evacuations, and roads. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But really the most important part of what we discussed was, you know, um, building a geospatial game plan. And that starts with identifying your team. Not sure about my actions here reversed, but it starts with uh, identifying your team, which includes the public, understanding what the public needs. Identify the core information needs for your audience and then develop a game plan for addressing those needs. And you're gonna hear more about that today. And again, the, the three core information needs we identified that make a good uh, public information map or public notice is, you know, if you can describe um, where evacuations are, where they can go for safety, in, in other words, open shelters, and how they can get there through road status, you've got a pretty good public information map. And if possible, and it's easy uh, to keep up to date, the hazard location itself. And we talked a little bit about why to use maps. And I think if you are a member of the NAPSIG community, you hear us talk a lot about uh, mapping and geospatial, but in particular for the public, maps are great because they can be easy to understand if you follow best practices. They can be kept up to date and they provide spatially explicit information, which I think is really important for public messaging. Um, the best maps are ones where you can either type your address or use your location and find out what to do based off that information. So to get started, I actually want to do a hands-on activity, uh, which is always risky. And what I would like for all of you to do is you can go on your phone or your laptop if you can multitask on your computer. Uh, go to menti.com and use the code 778624. And I'll wait for some people to give me the thumbs up. in the chat. Let me know if this is or is not working. All right. Jared says it's working. Zach says it's working. Okay, great. So the first question I believe should be, uh, you know, what is your uh, discipline? And uh, we'll watch the results come up here. Menti is a, um, just a platform I, we've been using for polls. It's a little more interactive and uh, I really like these bouncing balls. So we can start to see who our audience here is. So we have a good split of public information officers, GIS specialists, some first responders, uh, emergency managers, and then other, uh, which could really be anything, might be university and students and maybe even uh, private sector. All right. So before we go to the next question, I need to give you a little more information. Um, let's play choose an alert for the public. And for those of you that are PIOs and received training on this, this might be an easy uh, question, but for maybe the GIS special, it's something you haven't thought about. But which message would you choose for the public? Message A or message B? And I'm gonna pull up my, uh, I'll advance the Menti uh, poll here. And I'll pull it off to the side and you can think about this. I'll give everybody uh, a few seconds here. All right. And usually once I show which one's leading, everybody just follows. But uh, looks like message A is getting a lot of the votes. And uh, I tried to do something fancy here and look at which audience is saying what, but it looks like a lot of the PIOs are saying message A, and since they're the, uh, the experts, I'm gonna say uh, they're, they're probably right. But let's talk a little bit about why. 
Um, well, there's some good resources out there. There's actually a ton, but since we're getting to wildfire season for a lot of us out West or even in uh, the Southeast, there's a website I came across just last week and I felt like it was appropriate. Uh, it's called uh, Planning for Wildfire, Tips for Creating 360 Character Wireless Emergency Alert Templates. And they've got some tips here. Uh, include specific content in a set order. Avoid unclear statements and jargon. Use simple and familiar language. Accurately depict the severity, urgency, and certainty. Uh, use capital letters uh, to increase attention and make the message personal. So if you've uh, followed guidelines like that, you'd probably go with message A. Um, neither are wrong answers, but it's good to see here that there's some common understanding around alerts. So what happens if we do something similar here and this time we use uh, maps? And you can only tell so much from uh, the photos here, but map A is a static map that's been tweeted or shared out on Facebook. And map B is a dynamic uh, web-based map that updates um, with incident information over time. Which one would you choose for sharing with the public? And I'm gonna advance our menti here. And I'll pull this back up. So again, map B being a dynamic resource and map A being static. All right, and this was not meant to uh, insult anyone's intel intelligence. You might have good reasons for using a static map. Um, looks like we have at least one rebel here, but um, good. So everybody kind of accepts then that there's a general approach to alerts and messaging, and there should be a general approach to uh, maps for the public. And we'll talk a little bit about you know, a perspective here. So static maps can be difficult to update once shared. That's one of the biggest challenges with sharing a screenshot of a map. Uh, once you share a screenshot or a static list of place names, it really is hard to unshare that information. And that information might get shared. Um, I like to pick on my mom, but she might not know that a post uh, is now irrelevant and she might share that hours or even days later. Whereas dynamic maps and websites, when you share those, uh, you can update them behind the scenes. And now my mom would be helping you with your message versus uh, sharing stale information. So just an example there. All right, so that was just uh, to see if people are awake. At least 70 of you are paying attention, so that's good. Uh, as far as questions for our presenters today, uh, these were some ones that I pitched to them a few weeks ago when they agreed to sign up for this. And uh, I just wanted to share them with you before we get started. Number one was, what did you have in place with regards to a public information or a geospatial game plan prior to uh, COVID-19 impacting your agency? What has worked well for your team in the past? You could speak to things that maybe didn't work so well. And then any adaptations you've put in place uh, since uh, COVID-19's impacted your agency. And so those were some guiding questions. And um, with that, I think we'll just get started. For uh, introduction here, I just wanna introduce uh, Justin Cates, who's the Director of Emergency Management at the City of Nashua, New Hampshire. And Justin brings a great approach uh, to not just this webinar, he also is a member of the board at NAPSIG Foundation and gives us a lot of great guidance and understands uh, technology and, and emergency management quite well. So that should be enough time for you to unmute yourself. Uh, Justin, are you with us? I'm with you, thanks a lot. All right, turn it over to you and just let me know when to advance slides. Perfect, all right, we'll do our next slide now. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about uh, the synergies that are available between GIS and public information. Um, in the city of Nashua, we have been a strong supporter of GIS for a long time, but I think we're finally to the point where we're leveraging that tool for all the different capabilities that we need to have as an emergency management agency. And so I'll just give you a little bit of a background of of where we came when it came to uh, developing a good public information capability within the city and how we've been able to embed GIS within it. So one of the first things that we did in the city when we came on board was to really ensure that all of our key stakeholders within the community had crisis communications training, understood the basics and the value of uh, getting good information to the public. And all of our 
Um, all of our approach really focused around a model called the National Response Team Joint Information Center model. There's a document uh, which is uh, freely available online as well as some training from the U.S. Coast Guard on how to implement this model as a way to connect and uh, collaborate with all of your uh, city divisions or your county uh, departments uh, for your, the state agency, how to work with other state agencies when pushing information out in one unified fashion. Uh, and if you're familiar with the incident command system, it follows in line with that to ensure you've built out a, a really strong joint information center. So we started off with the basics, made sure that uh, we had a way to work together as, uh, as a city. Uh, but what was funny is we never practiced working in that environment until COVID-19. And we'll talk a little bit about COVID-19 a little bit later. On the GIS side, one of the things we started doing early on was leveraging the out-of-the-box templates and resources that were available from Esri as part of their emergency management solution. So you'll find that uh, there's a number of uh, quick templates uh, that are public-facing types of interactive and dynamic maps that you can use to promote public information during your incidents. One of the weaknesses we dealt with was that we were seen as the default PIO during incidents. And that was a challenge because we're also trying to manage the incident. But uh, the strength was we were strong GIS supporters, so we knew how to use GIS when it came to our public info program. Next slide. So in Nashua, the primary hazards that we deal with on a frequent basis, winter storms, severe storms, uh, flooding, whether it be riverine flooding or flash flooding in our downtown areas, as well as special events, uh, another big area that we've uh, had to deal with, at least on an annual basis for some of our major events, which it seems like we won't be doing this year, thankfully. Um, but how were we able to apply GIS to the public information uh, uh, needs of, of, of those different hazards that we dealt with? So primarily citizens and businesses and other community stakeholders are looking for the following things. They want to know, what's the status of the road conditions? Are there any closures during the incident? Uh, what's the status of critical services, whether they're done by our municipality or critical services that are provided by uh, nonprofits uh, or the private sector within the community? We also use uh, GIS as a way to capture crowdsourced social media reports and put them onto a map uh, so that we can share that back out with the community so they're aware of what's going on. Protective actions. Uh, one of the things that you'll find is uh, you can give somebody a text, uh, a, a brief amount of text about what you want them to do during an emergency, whether it's to evacuate or to shelter in place. But by providing them with a graphic that gives them a better indication of the area that's most concerned or where you would like them to go, it's much more intuitive and it's much more natural for the citizen. Business status is another area where we've used GIS uh, to help push out our public information. And then power outages, which is extremely challenging because that's not a responsibility that we have as a municipal government. We have to collaborate with our local utility and try and uh, collaborate on the tools and maps that we're sharing so that both of those pieces of information are available on there. We came up with a rule of thumb when it came to uh, whether something should be on a map or not. And it ultimately came down to if the piece of information that our Joint Information Center is trying to get out to the public has a location attached to it, it should probably be on a map. And so we use that rule when we're, when we're coming up with messaging is, should that be on a map? Yes, if it's got a location assigned to it, it needs to be either on a static graphic as part of the press release, all the way through some sort of an interactive dynamic tool. Next slide. So where have we seen challenges when we're talking about integrating GIS and our public information function? Uh, the first is, is really the workflows. And um, you, these folks uh, in public information, they're typically communication specialists, external affairs specialists within our municipal departments. Uh, they rely heavily on uh, routine. And if we're throwing a new system in place for them in the middle of an emergency, that's way different than the normal process that they use to get information to the public, it's going to fail. And it has failed in the past. So one of the things that we do is we get them uh, in, in the mode of using GIS uh, on a frequent basis to help push information out. So as an example, our public works external affairs specialists, they use GIS to help promote 
permitted construction uh, or road closures. And that way it allows them to easily move into an emergency mode where there's many more road closures due to flooding or uh, trees down or wires down. Uh, so it, it just keeps them in the same mindset and it doesn't throw them off uh, when there's some sort of an emergency incident. The second is public information integration with work orders. So as uh, reports are coming in from the public of trees down, wires down, we want the public to know about that information as well. But we're reacting and we're responding to those requests as they're coming in. So it's important for you to design systems that enable those work orders as they're being reported into your uh, 311 or 211, that they get entered into a system and they're automatically being relayed to that joint information center so that they can make sure that, that stuff is being pushed out to the public as well. And the last one is mapping from a PIO perspective. Uh, you know, I, I can say that uh, one of the early challenges we had with our GIS team when it came to creating public maps is the GIS team looks, likes to have lots of layers, lots of gadgets and widgets on the tools. Uh, and sometimes they're overly complicated for the average Joe. And this is something that uh, we, you know, we're able to leverage the expertise of our public info folks to ensure that the, the design was simple, it was intuitive, and it was easy for somebody to understand what we were trying to portray in the message. Next slide. And to close us out, uh, kind of giving you an indication of how things have changed and what we might have learned from COVID-19 when it comes to integration of GIS and public info. For this incident, our primary concerns were around locations of those ad hoc services that were being provided to the community, whether it be uh, testing sites, uh, medical care that's being provided to community members, or the locations where uh, students can pick up meals now that the schools are closed. Uh, those things were put on the maps as easy way for people to find those resources in the community. The, the Probably the most important piece was the status of businesses and services. That was important for us in emergency management uh, to know really the status and health of our economy within the community. But it was also important for some of our code enforcement officials. It was important for our economic development. Uh, many folks were able to leverage the information about the status of businesses and there's a neat tool that we were able to put together with the assistance of, of NAPSIG called the Business and Service Status Reporter. Uh, you can check it out there on the link that's located on the slide deck and uh, there'll be more information in this slide deck that'll tell you how you can implement a similar tool to this within your jurisdiction. Uh, but this was something I think was a, a great crowdsource method to capture information from the community about the status of businesses and make sure that all the key players that needed to know that information were receiving it at the same time. And then the enforcement of stay at home guidelines, you know, we're seeing an opportunity now to use GIS to track those complaints that are coming from citizens about uh, those locations that aren't wearing a mask or that aren't putting those physical distancing resources in play. Uh, so that's another area where GIS and PIOs have been working closely together during this incident. So some of the lessons that we've learned so far, and there's probably many to, to learn as we move forward, uh, we embedded a GIS representative in our virtual joint information center. That way, during any messaging that was going out to the public, the GIS rep was there to say, hey, I can put this on a map. Or have you thought about adding uh, some sort of a geospatial aspect to the messaging that you're putting out? The other challenge that we're seeing in this incident uh, because of the advent of the new Esri hub is that uh, we're getting multiple locations where COVID information is being put out to the public. And I would just say that uh, if your jurisdiction's thinking about putting sort of a landing page for COVID information, uh, you know, only use one location to put this info up. So in the case of Nashua, we had a COVID-19 website, we had an Esri hub for COVID-19, we had a, a thing called Live Stories, which was a data dashboard, which had the same information. It was becoming challenging to keep all those tools up to date and really they were very duplicative. And the last piece is crowdsource data versus static data. Our GIS team was very much focused on static data. They would collect the static uh, uh, data on healthcare facilities, whether it was open or closed. And at the same time, we were putting together this business and service status tool, which was being crowdsourced by the community. And you would find uh, that there was there was discrepancies between the the what we were considering our authorita authoritative data. It was not really uh, correct in most cases. The crowdsource data was much better. Uh, it was much more accurate, much more up to date than the stuff that our our GIS team was putting together. So definitely something that uh, you need to consider when putting together your your program. Next slide. 
So uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end of this about some of the tools that we put into place. I believe uh, the next slides after this are some resources uh, that you'll be able to have when the slide deck goes out. Uh, the first one being that business status reporter that NAPSIG had put together uh, with information of, on how to implement it within your uh, jurisdiction. Uh, next slide is uh, the uh, crowdsource EM toolkit, uh, crowdsourceem.org, which is a great resource if you're looking at trying to find ways to gather information from the public and help uh, provide better information back out to the public using social media, GIS, and other technologies. And then the final slide. Oh, and then there will be a slide uh, that'll come out with the slide deck of links that are public information focused and uh, have some information on templates that you can use to create a joint information center or a virtual joint information center for your own. Thank you very much. Thanks, Justin. And that list of resources will be at the end of the slide deck. Um, and I, I called it out as Justin's. So perfect. All right, and just a quick reminder for those of you that have questions, um, please use the Q&A function versus the chat. That'll help us kind of keep all the questions in one spot and we'll do the best we can to answer them. All right, next up, we'll move a little further west. I guess if our first webinar, we had Sonoma County on in California. Now we had Nashua on the East Coast. Uh, we'll go to the, the heart of the Rockies, so to speak, for uh, Douglas County here. And I'd like to introduce uh, Joel and Lauren. I've worked closely with Joel through the uh, North Central All Hazards uh, region in Colorado and been really impressed with all of the counties there. And uh, Joel stood out as having a good story about working closely with the PIO and actually having some, uh, some game plan together to make sure it's uh, a, you know, a formal partnership. So I thought this would be a good uh, story to hear. So with that, uh, Joel, are you able to, to speak? Please, I'm unmuted, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear, and Lauren? Yes, I'm here. Perfect, all right, take it away. I'll go to your next slide. Thank you, Paul. Well, said, uh, my name is Joel Hansen. I'm a GI Services Manager for Douglas County, Colorado. Um, for you guys that may not be familiar with Colorado, we are the county that sits between Denver and Colorado Springs. So we're kind of a suburban area for both metro metropolitan areas. Um, we kind of have a wildland urban interface with our mountains and with our rangeland and also urban areas to our north um, as well as other Denver. Um, and, uh, hand it over to Lauren to introduce herself and take on the first slide. Hi guys, I'm Lauren. I'm the uh, lead PIO with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. Um, so I think my role in this is a, um, maybe a little bit different than you guys may be used to um, as far as communicating with city or town PIOs or county PIOs. Um, so I guess I'll talk a little bit about how we um, integrate into our EOC since it seems that's more um, kind of the, the area we're talking about here. But um, just so you guys know um, kind of how we work here at the Sheriff's Office, um, our PIO team consists of a total of five of us. Um, I'm the, the PIO during the day, regular business hours, um, and then we have four that are on call um, that handle questions after hours, uh, or even if I'm not in the office, they can handle um, you know, calls and questions from media um, at that time. Um, so we, we communicate quite regularly um, about what everything that's going on. Um, as far as the Sheriff's Office PIO responsibility, it's our responsibility to report on any public safety concerns. Um, I know we're kind of addressing things about pre-COVID and, and, you know, after COVID, kind of what things will look like, but um, quite honestly, as far as um, COVID's concerned and the Sheriff's Office PIOs um, are concerned, um, public health concerns were not really our message. So it was important and remains very important that we continue to share the message you know, of our um, health departments and of the county uh, as they're kind of the ones that have that main jurisdiction over um, the public health concerns. Uh, so kind of our daily responsibilities are, you know, press releases, press conferences, and then if we have a major incident, we'll be um, either on the IMT or the EOC, um, and we'll do a lot of the social media 
um, or all of the social media with regards to uh, our major incidents. And I put in there that it's uh, usually a combined effort. We um, here at the Sheriff's Office, one of our PIOs is the lead social media coordinator. And so um, just depending on what the circumstances are and who's working at the time, um, that may vary as to who's going to do the social media. But um, typically, we will have somebody who's going to do social media while there's somebody else who's working on press releases and, and other information that we're pushing out to the public. Mm -hmm. If you could go to the next slide. You want me to speak to this one? Yeah, um, go ahead. All right, so uh, over the years, um, we've uh, made some modifications within our EOC. Um, you know, I've been uh, with the county now for 14 years. And in that time, um, you know, GIS used to be a component of just the plans ESF. Um, as we've done our recent uh, emergency operations plan, uh, GIS is now flexed across as a direct um, report into the emergency management group, also um, within the plans group, um, also IT, and they also sit as adjacent to the PIO um, and public works and logistics. So we're kind of in a central location with the front of the room because a lot of people are kind of drawn to that map. Um, going back a few years ago, probably about five now, we built a hybrid situational awareness tool that we called CCOP um, that was built off of our own server capabilities along with some of the Esri solutions that were just coming out at the time with the local government solution. And um, it was kind of this comprehensive view of all different types of variables because we'd get called in for wildfire on most occasions, but then we had occasions with gas leaks and what have you. Um, and as you can see on the slide here, you know, that map has a lot of action going on there. A lot of layers are interactive. Um, we provide different ESF stations with access to it so that they can do their own analytics, kind of view what's going on out there and what have you. Um, and it, it really started to open the eyes of people and it really calmed the EOC to help them understand the, the situation as it uh, develops. Um, with that said, though, this was a complicated map to put out to the public. And uh, actually, on one particular day, I believe I was sitting with Lauren in the EOC when we had a three fires burning in our county, and Esri had just released their public information solution. I'm going to move on to the next um, slide here. Um, so with this new solution, it became uh, kind of a godsend because then we could just take our services that we already had into that robust situational awareness tool and plug them into this easy template that Esri made available. And so on the right there, you see kind of our new way with an ArcGIS Online hosted application leveraging that solution. We plug in links to the you know DCSO's newsroom, um, Twitter, and you know, various social media feeds. We have it tailored so that when we flip a public view flag in some of our services, it becomes instantaneously viewable onto that application, which is nice. And on the left, you know, the old way that our, our PIO would deal with a lot of mapping communications would be Google Map Insets. You know, and the problem with that is they become static, and so they're continually doing updates. Um, we had a scenario uh, a couple of years ago now called the bomb cyclone, where we had a major blizzard, major storm that shut down um, our state for you know two days. We had 700 people stranded in our in our county, for example, in shelters. And when we finally got in there, and we were starting to show roads opening and abandoned vehicles out there that were blocking roads and what have you, you know, we stood up on this public information. Um, application on, on social media and it started getting all kinds of hits because we were finally giving some live information out there that was more current than anything else that was out there coming from the state, for example. So it was kind of our first um, spearhead into that new foray. And um, it's you know, one of those tools that we have at our, at our um, disposal uh, for future events. So it, it really kind of changed the dynamic to provide real-time information for people, um, you know, kind of like as Dustin was saying and Paul as well. Um, if we go on to the next slide. Um, I guess kind of talking about COVID, you know, as Paul kind of laid out the, uh, the template, we were asked about COVID and for our county, COVID was a, it was a different animal. You know, it, it didn't really affect how our PIO and GIS in, integrate, you know, we were closely linked in the EOC. We're adjacent, we're, we're open for communication. 
provides a really nice two-way communication because if there's information happening in the field because our PIEO usually has people out in the field sending information back, it really opens up that, that, you know, that transparency, if you will. COVID was different. COVID, at first, we were trying to figure out who owned it. Was it our county that owned it? And you know, in the end, it settled on our, our health department, and our health department is called Tri-County Health, and they manage three other counties. So then at that point, it became a, a more of a relationship between our public affairs folks within the county administration and Tri-County Health. Um, and Lauren, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit, but if you can recall, PIO had a rather minimal role in that. Is that, is that a fair statement? Sure, so as a sheriff's office PIO, kind of going back to my other slide, this was um, not a public safety issue. So really, and I'm sure a lot of you PIOs have kind of heard this term, I hear it, you know, in almost every training I, I'm at is, you know, that whole stay in your lane. So it really was imperative that we grasped who owned this, um, you know, this situation so that we knew where the information should be coming from and then what we should ultimately be sharing. Um, we kind of determined here in the county that obviously that we were getting our information from Tri-County Health, the health department, and so they really should be the lead. And then we would just basically be in a support role at that point, um, sharing all of their information, trying to keep the messaging consistent. Um, so I think that was really the biggest um, takeaway for us is just making sure that, you know, we were sharing the same consistent message that was coming from the proper sources. Um, so as far as, you know, COVID affecting the way we as the sheriff's office do things as PIOs, um, it really didn't change things for us. Um, we kind of still did things as we would normally sharing information from the source or um, showing our support in ways that we can through social media or sharing press releases and those sorts of things, um, but not necessarily creating our own content as if it was our story or our um, situation to share. So it did, as Joel said, it did quickly bypass the Sheriff's Office PIO and then kind of became the responsibility of um, public affairs within the county. Um, and then, you know, her connection with the health department and so, again, kind of being in that support role, we didn't have to, we didn't take a lead on this. Um, so sharing the information is, is fairly common for what we do in uh, law enforcement, unless we are the lead agency on the incident or the um, public safety concern that is currently going on. So Lauren and Joel, that, that really helps give us some context. I just had one question before we close then. Um, we, would you say that the working relationship you, you know, you two as individuals have, um, but also your roles, the person who shares maps and information uh, digitally and the, the PIO who sort of leads when it's the, uh, the sheriff's incident, um, were you glad you knew each other already, even though the game plan changed? Like what type of impact did that have on your ability to uh, be prepared for other incidents? Yeah, there was a comfort level there. I mean, um, you know, as Lauren pointed out, there is multiple members of the PIO and personally myself and, you know, members of my staff have those relationships in place. So depending on who responds to the event and who's in the EOC, you know, we know each other and, and we know that going forward, we're going to keep that communication going back and forward and uh, keep that, you know, respect up, uh, to make sure that we're getting the best information out there as necessary. Yeah, I think just to kind of piggyback on what Joel said, you know, we've worked closely together um, and I know it's kind of maybe a unique circumstance and maybe some of you guys kind of face the same thing, but working for the sheriff's office, you know, when we work um, wildland fires or um, the storm, the bomb cyclone, like Joel mentioned, you know, those sorts of things, the sheriff's office typically takes the lead um, in public information. And so we work very closely with our GIS and the EOC. Um, however, our daily responsibilities of putting out press releases about, you know, criminal activity or whatever, we don't necessarily work um, hand in hand with GIS for those sorts of things. So I think it's important that we continue to 
get together and um, you know work together in the roles that we can um, so that when you know we do run into these sorts of public safety concerns or whatever we're already aware of you know aware of how each other works and things like that so when we train in the EOC we always have our GIS guys there um, and that makes it helpful as far as comfort level and knowing how each other is going to work and and what their abilities are and, and how we can utilize each other to help each other's roles. That's a great point Lauren. Um, you know we, fortunately knock on wood we haven't had a lot of activations over the last year or so but you know all as you mentioned through the NCR the North Central All Hazards, Hazards region which is a 10 county um, region around the Denver metro area um, we coordinate on a regular basis and we also have regional exercises once or twice a year and in those exercises you know we test things like the IMT and we test you know um, public information or, or what have you and through those it maintains those relationships as well um, you know one of the comments I've heard from one of Lauren's colleagues is you know, unfortunately these these operations happen too far um, you know or too too few and too far between sometimes that the PIO folks Kind of forget about how to use the tools but during an activation that's why having us so close to the pio is beneficial because we can kind of be there to guide them and um you know kind of help them admin the site a little bit and get it up and running well very good i really appreciate both of your time today and justin as well and i i put another resource in the slides here i hope you don't mind uh a link to the blog uh and user story that you just submitted with esri and I thought maybe that'd be just a chance to say thank you to all of the private sector partners that have been so supportive. Uh, I, I happen to work closely with the Ezra Disaster Response Program, but I know, you know, Microsoft here and others have all kind of reached out to their customers and offered support and uh, just can't thank them enough. I, I think that, uh, Joel, your team would have succeeded no matter what in this uh, response, but I think having some of those solutions and resources set up by the Esri Solutions team was really, uh, really beneficial. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, you know, I guess you could say we're opportunistic, right? You know, we took advantage of the COVID uh, resources when they came out, stood up a hub. Originally, we stood up an internal hub because, like I said, we were in a supporting role trying to aggregate information and, and try to lean out of it the most authoritative um, truth as all this data was just starting to compile at the beginning. Uh, so we stood up an internal uh, COVID hub for operation. We called it the operational hub uh, because we were getting data from the state health department and from our local health department. And so we're trying to bring it together. And eventually through the public affairs group and through our county manager, they wanted to get a version of that out to the public. And then we took a filtered version of it, if you will, out to the public as well. And then Paul, as you're aware, you know, with the NCR, we also stood up a statewide dashboard. It was used uh, quite effectively for a lot of our uh, partner agencies as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was uh, still ongoing. I'm still running scripts this morning to maintain the data. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, don't give up. I really appreciate it. Um, another uh, resource here just uh, for those that are the PIOs, although I think for GIS specialists, it's especially useful as well. Um, getting familiar with the you know, public information officer section. Uh, IACP is just one, one resource Lauren mentioned that uh, has been useful for her, especially in her role in a, in a sheriff's office. So um, that link will be available through the slides. All right. Well, we are uh, getting closer to the end here. I wanted to do a little bit of recap, uh, try to draw from some of what we learned from the, the two groups of speakers here today, and uh, also just point you to some other resources. So. I think one of the key messages, uh, and this is something that at NAPSIG Foundation we really try to stress is, you know, you need to know who your team is. Um, something that both uh, Nashua and Douglas County expressed, you know, like they, they include their GIS specialist in the team. Uh, you need to identify what the core information needs are, and that's easier maybe to do for a hazard you've been exposed to before. This is just an example from a tornado. Um, but if you use that approach, you can adapt to things like COVID-19 or who knows what's next and formulate a game plan. And so we have some resources. I thought I'd show like a quick example of, you know, a game plan could literally be a chart like this on a whiteboard where we look at three things we know the public wants to know. Am I safe here? Where can I go to be safe? And how can I get there? 
and what we need to do is work backwards from what would a good product information product look like for the public and what are all the things we need to do to get there and so uh, these are just examples uh, not particular to any of the speakers today but of an operational game plan for supporting our evacuation status maybe it gets hand drawn by a sheriff um, and then a gis specialist specialist updates the layer uh, that layer hopefully can tie in with some of your wireless alerting and your map is live and ready to go uh, and ready to be embedded with social media. If you talk through that game plan and actually practice it before there's a disaster, to Justin's point, it's an expected procedure and you'll likely succeed. If you try to invent it on the fly, uh, you're gonna probably struggle. And so it's important to have game plans for the different, what we call core information needs, especially for the public. And I like to start with the public because if you have a good public information map, you've actually already got a good internal uh, situational awareness viewer. So we talked a lot about that in December, uh, but I wanted to bring it up here again today. And then also in December, and you should go to those slides and the recording, we covered a lot more on the technical best practices and I thought maybe we could revisit those here today. Uh, I'd sort of made a checklist, arbitrary uh, five S's. Uh, the first one was simplicity. So speaking to Justin's needs before is uh, a GIS map we often will emphasize the number of layers we have in our library, but for the public, we're really trying to answer those core information needs. And so a simple map may do better than uh, a powerful map, so to speak. Uh, it should be scalable. I think Joel mentioned, you know, they've gotten a lot of hits on their maps, uh, their public maps, especially the first one they made. And for that reason, and for all sorts of other reasons, you know, you're, you're, what you're exposing to the public needs to be ready for demand. You actually want your map to go viral. And we, there's lots of technical best practices. I think this one blog by Esri uh, sums it up pretty well, but basically use ArcGIS online and don't let the, uh, any of your internal services that are not ready to scale sneak into your public maps. Um, security. I think a lot of times for people who are new to this are worried that if there's a public map, does that mean the public can edit it? And uh, Joel described a workflow where actually you can make it so that only people on the inside that we know can edit data, but the public can see it. And this is all controlled through things called feature layer views. Uh, if you're using ArcGIS online, if you're using other like open source platforms, I'm sure there's a corollary, but you wanna be able to really reduce the lag time between the time that someone edits something and it shows up on a public map. Uh, I think even in Justin's use case where they're actually allowing for businesses to self-report, they use the same workflow, but they involve uh, potential for a vetting procedure where they can vet information before it shows back up on the public map. Uh, but in all cases, you need to have this plan in advance. You don't wanna build it on the fly. And so there's a great resource there to talk about this process. With regards to uh, smartphones, uh, what I'm really trying to say is you really have to consider mobile responsiveness. Uh, more and more of the public, uh, especially as people go back to work, they might be accessing the news or that type of information uh, coming out of a disaster on a mobile device versus their desktop. And, and so if something looks good on a desktop, that's good but you have to then go and test it on a mobile device and make sure that it is gonna at least perform and not confuse the end user uh, with some kind of interface that doesn't make sense or, or just crash all together. And the good news is uh, there's lots of resources uh, within WebGIS, within ArcGIS Online for making mobile first or mobile friendly maps. Um, and last time I talked about an app I like to use to test websites called the Responsinator. And then uh, shareable, and I think this is probably the most important part for the PIOs of all the technical stuff we've talked about. It's really important to show your PIOs how your maps can be shared. Um, these short links can be created for most of your online maps, and those fit really well inside of alert messages and tweets and Facebook. Um, they can be embedded inside of emergency management websites. One of my favorite examples is uh, Southland uh, District Council in New Zealand. They've done a great job of just always having a live map embedded in their website and it's ready to go for any incident. Um, sharing via social media. One of the things I saw last year, especially in California, was more and more uh, video briefings, especially from wildfire incident management teams, where they use 
a map for the briefing to explain what's happening. And then they actually share that map with the public in some form. And I think that's really a powerful uh, medium. It shows that you understand the situation. It shows the public what you know and don't know uh, in a very clear way. And it, it invites them in to uh, use the same tools you use. Uh, using them at public meetings. And then if you're a GISer and you want your map to get shared, you have to be uh, really careful and have uh, a checklist in place to check all your layers, your web maps and your apps and make sure that they're shared uh, publicly and, and tested ahead of time. So again, just some examples of uh, good sharing practices. We heard from County of Sonoma uh, last time and you can see here they're sharing their maps on Twitter. Uh, they're even using them in public meetings. And while they do have a paper map there, they also have a dynamic map that can be used in the briefing. And then last year we had one of our uh, NAPSIG and GIS core um, collaboration maps where we were sharing locations of emerging wildfires. And I actually got to see a reporter use the map uh, live on screen. And I thought that was a really compelling use even for the, the media to be using maps in an inter interactive briefing. So, but none of this is possible unless you have a, uh, a game plan. And so again, my reverse order uh, presentation here, but start with your team. Um, if you're a PIO and you haven't met your GIS specialist, maybe start with a, a cup of coffee or a Zoom call in the near future and just get to know them and find out, you know, do they have uh, time or bandwidth to work with you in between disasters to get prepared? And if they don't, find a way to make that happen. Um, because I think no matter what tools or software you pay for or, uh, you know, a vendor tells you it's going to do everything, it's always going to be powered by human intelligence and you need to be in contact with those humans in order to uh, make things run. Um, so I think, you know, really identifying your team is important. Think about the core information needs and in particular, if you're a PIO, you should be starting with what the public needs to know and make sure that you have workflows that support it develop the game plan and then test it and refine it. I think with uh, the state that we're in now with lots of virtual meetings, it's an even better time to take advantage of uh, using digital technology and testing out these approaches uh, well in advance of whatever your next disaster might be. And um, I always like to share this photo, but this was a uh, shared with me from Stephen at City of Reading after the car fire, but uh, basically, for the first time ever, we've all seen those signs of uh, people thanking the firefighters, which is of course uh, most important in a wildland fire situation, but actually thanking the fire map updaters, whoever that might be. And I thought that was uh, a real testament to the fact that maps do matter for the public. So um, a couple of resources here uh, that I wanna discuss before we close out. Uh, NAPSIG is maintaining a sandbox where you can test some of these workflows, much like what Joel described, where you can try editing in an internal viewer and then having it show up on a public map. That is meant for exercises and for testing out some of these um, solutions before you go through the trouble of setting them up. So again, I can't stress enough, that's for uh, training and exercise only. And that's something that'll be available here through the, the website on the slide. And, you know, building your game plan. Uh, you could do that right now when you get off the call. You could take the same uh, PowerPoint slide I showed you about building a game plan and use that as a template. And we are always looking for feedback on this. But we've used this same template for a variety of different use cases, including uh, more recently, we've been helping a, the state of South Carolina search and rescue program uh, build a geospatial game plan for their search and rescue uh, and wide area search tools. And so we've taken that same approach and applied it. I think uh, it's a good place to start. We're all comfortable generally with PowerPoint. And um, if you can't get together and do it on a whiteboard, it's a good tool to use remotely. Uh, other things coming up, we've got prep tech talks uh, every month this year. So make sure you go to napsigfoundation.org and go to our events page. Uh, we also have postponed our in-person gathering Inspire until uh, the spring of 2021. It will be in Salt Lake City and the date is coming soon. Um, and we will just have more prep tech talks in the meantime to replace that, uh, that event and fill the gap. Um, in the very near future, uh, in June, we are doing sort of a two-part webinar uh, to discuss COVID-19 and do a bit of a hot wash um, while the disaster is still upon us. And that uh, tentative dates are June 23rd and 25th. Uh, pay attention to the NAPSIG 
website and newsletter for details. Tomorrow, if you happen to live in a tornado state or have potential for tornadoes or even are just interested, uh, we're doing a joint webinar to support FEMA. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, geospatial game plans for tornadoes in particular. And I think it's worthwhile attending uh, even if you uh, don't think you'll be impacted by tornadoes because I think it gets this point across about core information needs really well. And that is also a uh, no cost event and you can uh, sign up from the NAPSIG website or the link that'll be provided. All right, and there's never enough time to get through all the resources. What I like to do is at the end of the slide deck, I'll just put links that have come up in conversation um, with our presenters here. So a lot of the things that Justin referred to or I referred to will all be here uh, for you to explore. Um, of particular note is there's a new wildfire feed released uh, and hosted by Esri that's powered by some government uh, authoritative data, including Irwin and NIPSI, if you uh, are familiar with wildland fire. And that's a really important announcement. Uh, NAPSIG and the GIS Core and Cedar Digital are collaborating on a project to even complement that live feed uh, suite of data. And uh, more on that coming soon, maybe in a newsletter. And then always paying attention to what the GIS Core is doing. Uh, they support NAPSIG Foundation and uh, agencies on a number of initiatives. We talked a little bit about crowdsourcing, but there's a uh, crowdsource photo portal that we've been using to support tornadoes, floods, earthquakes, and uh, hurricanes. And that leaves me with my last point. Um, you know, we didn't talk a lot today about how to work with volunteers. And I think that's a really important part of the picture. And I think a lot of times PIOs play a key role in that, but I think GIS specialists should as well. And so looking at uh, organizations like Cedar Digital Core or uh, you know, a VOAD uh, near you, I think it's really important part of the picture. And I hope to follow up on a, a webinar on that topic sometime soon. So with that, uh, we've got a few minutes. We'll officially end this in three minutes, but we'll try to get through some of the Q&A and stick around a little bit longer. But I just really wanted to thank our presenters before they go. Uh, thank the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Group for uh, providing time and resources to work on outreach like this and some of the best practices we've talked about here today. So thank you all for making it. And I look forward to seeing you either tomorrow or next month. So with that, uh, Jared, do you have a couple of Q&A that you uh, think we should address here? Yes, uh, there's a couple of uh, pretty good questions uh, that I'll just open up to uh, the panel. Um, what helpful guidance is available for ensuring the information provided via maps is made accessible to a segment of the population who are blind, have low vision, or just can't read maps? And I'll also add in there, um, maybe English is a second language. Um, there is an Esri blog post about uh, some accessibility um, that I'm going to paste a link to in the chat, but um, I'll open that up to you guys if you have any, uh, anything to say about that. Yeah, this is uh, Paul here. So it's something I don't personally uh, have a lot of experience with, but in most of the web uh, mapping platforms we use, there's always an option to add alternate text. And I think the Esri blog will have more information on that, but that should cover um, some of the accessibility issues depending on how well you describe what's on your uh, on your website or on your map. But I would love to hear if any of the other panelists have experience with this, or um, maybe at NAPSIG we can do a little bit more digging and, and find out uh, if there are people who have good, good experiences uh, making it possible. Anyone else on the panel have experience with that? Unfortunately, I do not. Yeah, working with alternate languages, uh, some of the apps, um, the good news is I think like web map builder and others, when you click on the share button, you can try to share it in another language and it'll at least translate the elements um, in the application itself um, to the best of its ability. Um, but I think it's a really important question for the PIOs that you work with to make sure that your map is going to reach uh, the majority of the population. And for those that you can't, you have a, a backup plan for so. But yeah, check out the blog that uh, Jared sent. I think it's got some, uh, some information about making a story map accessible. Right, and just one more quick question. Um, 
What are some of your best practices using GIS to reach out to public if you lose internet and cell phone access, uh, such as like a major earthquake or hurricane? And I believe uh, Justin uh, answered that in the Q&A, but if you'd like to elaborate on that, and then if any of the other panelists have anything to add. Yeah, one, one thing I'll just mention in brief is, you know, um, contact our friends in New Zealand. I, when I lived there, I feel that they did uh, a really outstanding job of making information that would be needed available in advance. So like if you move to New Zealand, you will pretty quickly know where your local civil defense center is and you will know what to do in a type of catastrophic emergency. And uh, the emergency managers and the GIS specialists there, they've pre-planned out all that information and um, even have methods for you know, getting information out by paper and um, setting up information centers. The other thing is uh, we can't ignore the ham radio community and the contributions that they'll likely make when uh, there's no internet or cell service in an area, but uh, ham radio is able to get out to the people who do. I think that's a really important part of your game plan. And if you haven't considered it and you live in earthquake country, uh, I think you should. But uh, Justin, did you have anything else to add? Nah, so I, I, my response was uh, we had a good example of that here during the COVID incident. Um, one of the audiences that we were looking at was the homeless community. There were some challenges around finding uh, bathrooms that were accessible to them. Normally, the bathrooms that they use are, are uh, open at facilities, which were now closed. So we distributed uh, porta potties and hand washing stations throughout the community. And uh, we needed to provide them with some easy access to understand where those were located. Uh, and so we put up some static maps that uh, had those locations on them. And uh, it was a good use of GIS and public information in a sort of a, an analog environment. That's great. Jared, did you see any others in there? Um, nope, I think that uh, answers them all. So thank you, everybody. All right, great. Thanks a lot, everybody. I will uh, stop recording now and uh, look forward to hearing your feedback.